Well, hey, welcome to Vista Church. Um, I said at the beginning, if you were in here, that this, though it is um, one of the least attended services just because it's at the end of the year, um, for me, it's actually one of my favorites. And it's one of my favorites because we get a chance to remember some things. So before I get into that, what I want to do is remind you of a couple of things. First of all, I want to say thank you to everybody who gave sacrificially to Vista Church in 2018. Um, I sent out a end of the year giving letter to kind of, if you didn't get it, it reminds you, it, it, it tells you all the different things that we did in 2018 as a church. Not to mention the weekly services and the, the youth group and the children's ministry and the, and the teachings, um, the people that raised their hand to receive Jesus. But the letter that I sent out kind of was a recap of all of the things that we were a part of, all the things that we gave to as a church. And I want you to know, if you don't already, that uh, not only do people give to the church to make this happen, but also the church gives a whole lot to things as well. I believe in giving, and I believe it's our job and it's our responsibility as a church to be salt and light. And so um, that letter, if you didn't get it, really listed all those different things. And we did a lot this last year. And I just want to remind you that uh, we don't take an offering here. And so the boxes are in the back. Um, it's something that I decided when we started Vista that I wanted us to have as a, as a thing that it, giving is between you and the Lord. And so um, I just want to encourage you at the end of the year, if you're able to help us, December is the biggest giving month of the year for any church, Vista included. And so if you haven't, um, and if you'd like to, we'd love to have you be able to give to us sacrificially to the work and to the ministry that we do, which is why I also send out that letter, because I want you to know what we're a part of and what your money is going to outside of just, you know, the, the space that we lease and the staff that we, that we provide for and all the rest. There's a lot of things that I believe God has for us to do. So thank you to everyone who gave. Thank you if you're still going to give. You need to postmark that. By December 31st, you can give online, you can give out at the kiosk, you can write a check and put it in the box, but uh, just really appreciate all of you who support us here at Vista Church and the ministry that God has for us. I also want to remind you our uh, next session of home groups is starting up. And you know, our home groups are an open system. Anybody can join a home group at any time. It's not like you've got to start at one point and then wait. We have three eight-week sessions throughout the year, starting in September. I already did that one, and then we take a month off in December, and then we start up again in January for eight weeks, and then we take about three, four weeks off, and then we have a final spring session, and then we have the whole summer off, and then we start up again. So that's our cycle for home groups, and I want to continue to encourage you. We don't have a midweek service here at Vista, but we do have home groups throughout the week, and they're all over the city. We've got them in Thornton, several in Thornton. We've got them in Westminster. We've got them in Broomfield. We've got them several in Arvada. We've got them in Wheat Ridge. And I'm always looking for more people that want to host a home group in their home. And so I write study questions, I send out my sermon notes, and they're sermon-based home groups. And so we have a chance as home groups to go through and talk about what we learned on Sunday morning. Because it's not too often when somebody can raise a hand and say, hey, hold on, Pastor Brennan, I didn't understand that. Can you go deeper in that section, please? That doesn't really happen on a Sunday morning. But in the home groups, you can do that. And we have a chance to apply then what it is that we learn on Sunday mornings. So if you haven't had a chance, go to our website, look at the home groups, whole website listing all the locations. Some groups do some things a little differently, which is cool. Um, doing a foundations and faith group, I lead that every single eight-week session. It starts over again, eight weeks of the foundations of faith. Love for you to be a part of that as well. So um, you can learn about that on our website or our Facebook page as well. All right, enough of announcements. I want to have you turn your Bibles, if you got into 2 Peter chapter 1. The reason why this is one of my favorite services is, is because I always do at the end of the year, this last service, I do a year in review. I, I take a moment myself, this whole week I did it, I go back and I, I look at all the different things that I taught in 2018, all the different series that I taught, all the different book studies that we did. And uh, I remind us of that because we're forgetful people. Anybody know how that's the case in life? We're forgetful people? Uh, um, so if you're perfect, you're not forgetful. And we, we'd like to know how you do it. But for the rest of us who aren't perfect, we are forgetful, aren't we? And we have a tendency not to remember things. And so we do a whole lot of things to jog our memory. Some people journal. How many people in here this morning are journalers? You like to journal. Do you, do you still do it on 
paper and you have a journal book? Yeah, I used to have a pastor's journal, nice leather thing that I would journal in, and now I do it online or I do it electronically. I journal in notes and stuff. Some people journal in order to remember things, and it's helpful. You know, however many years back you go and you have, you look at, and you go, oh, back in 2002, and you can read through those things. You can read 2003 or whatever year it is and be reminded of things in your life that happened because we forget those things. Uh, my parents just had a chance to go to Italy. It really made me mad because that's my dream vacation, and I didn't get a chance to go with them. Um, and so they went to Italy, and we had a nice uh, little dinner at their house. My mom made some Italian food, and uh, they showed us, it was really cool, electronically, all the pictures. Blew it up on the big screen there, and they took us through all the places they went, four different cities in Italy that they went to. And uh, we do that kind of thing as well. We, we take pictures to remember stuff, don't we? We take pictures of where we've been. You know, one of the coolest things that I just discovered, and maybe you already have, um, but my daughter and I were talking, my oldest, and she has moved out, and so, you know, a relationship changes when they're not living in the home anymore, and she's 20 years old, and we were talking about some things going on, and I said, you know, Alex, one of the coolest things that you can do is go back and look at our texts. We have group texts with her and Karen and I, her, her mom and me. We have single, just me and her, and then she has single ones with Karen, these threads of texts, and you know how far back they go? Well, as far back as you keep the text, right? And so I love being able to go back and just read the things that we've gone through. I love to remember the, the, the struggles that we had and how we resolved those struggles. I love to see the different highs and lows and things that she can't wait to tell me. So she texts me really quick to remind me, hey, Dad, guess what happened? And I can go back and I go back as far as my iPhone will allow. You can do that with your picture thread as well because we like to remember stuff, don't we? We're a forgetful people, and we like to remember things. And I want to remind you this morning of something Peter wrote. Peter was a guy who at times forgot a whole lot of things. He, he forgot what to say at times. He forgot what to do at times. He forgot what Jesus did for him at times. He forgot what his whole purpose was at times. And so Peter had something to say in the book of 2 Peter. You're already there, verse 1 of chapter 1. Peter starts by saying, Simon, Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of our God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them, his promises, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. He goes on in verse 5, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, caps it off with what the Bible says is the greatest gift, add to this love. For if you possess these qualities, you can go back and read all of those, make a list, those are amazing qualities if you possess these qualities. In growing measure, if they're increasing in your life, he says they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he says if anyone doesn't have them, these qualities, he is nearsighted and blind, and he has, read this, underline it, highlight it, he has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Well, I'll tell you, if there's anything in life as a believer in Jesus Christ, that you don't want to forget, it's that you have been forgiven and cleansed of your past sins. Amen? If there's anything Peter needed to remember, being a guy who made some pretty colossal mistakes, arguably the greatest of which was denying Jesus three times, the last of which was to his very face, eye to eye, face to face. I don't know the man. 
And yet when Jesus was resurrected, and when he walked and when he appeared to his disciples, Jesus made a point to reaffirm to Peter his love for him. He didn't meet him with condemnation and guilt and shame. He didn't meet Pete with, hey, I told you so, man. Couldn't you have? I, I told you. No. Instead, the Bible tells us that Peter was met by Jesus with love, with grace, and with forgiveness. The last thing Peter needed to do was to forget that he has been forgiven of his sins. And a person that fails to remember a critical truth like that, that he's been, he or she has been forgiven of their sins, folks, that's something that can cause people to have a bad year. That can be something that causes people not to grow in their faith when they're continually condemned by their sin, when they continually feel God is mad at them for their sin. And so Peter says, don't forget, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven of our sins. But honestly speaking, folks, we're all in this camp of being forgetful. We're all in this camp where we don't remember everything perfectly. And in fact, Scripture tells us over and over to remember the things that God has said, to remember the things that God has done, to remember the promises that God has made, to remember the promises that God has fulfilled. In fact, I love, it, love what it says in Deuteronomy 11, verse 18. Read this with me. Fix these words, Moses writes, of mine, speaking of God to his people. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and in your minds, the promises, the truth, the word. Tie them as symbols on your hands. And it says, bind them on your foreheads. And if you know your history, the Jews took this admonition literally, didn't they? They actually made little boxes. And they took these little boxes and they put scripture in these little boxes and then they strapped them with leather straps onto their forearms and onto their foreheads, literally. You can Google it right now. Phylacteries is what they're called. And so you got these folks walking around these boxes on their foreheads and these boxes with scripture in them on their wrists or on their hands because they knew they needed to remember the truth of God's word. Teach them, verse 19. Teach them. To your children, teach what? Teach my words, my promises, my truth to your children. Talking about them, my promises when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, write them, my promises, my word, my truth, God says to his people. Write them on the door frames of your houses and even on your gates. If you got a gate, go out and inscribe God's truth today on that gate. Literally, yes. Figuratively, yes, because we are a forgetful people. And so I find it helpful to see all the places, all the stones that God told his people to resurrect, all of the monuments that God reminded or told his people to build up, all of the memories that they would tell each other and pass it down orally. That's how they remembered scripture was they orally shared it with each other. They didn't have that writing ability at that time. At least not everybody, probably almost nobody, right? And so they, they told stories orally of what God had done because we are a forgetful people. And so with that whole backdrop in mind, with that whole construct, I want to remind you of what we covered in 2018 scripturally. And I've got a point at the end. I've got something I really want to encourage you with and challenge you with at the end because I want to remind you of all that we covered in 2018. And so if you remember, if you have that kind of perfect memory, <laughs> yeah, right. You remember that we started the year by looking at one of John's epistles known as 1 John. This was a, a book, we, 15 weeks we spent in 1 John. And I looked at this and we called it Light, Life, and Love. And as we looked at 1 John, the biggest thing that I think John, in writing this letter, if you remember, John was writing this letter in response to a heresy called Gnosticism. And that heresy told people in the early church, in the first century, it didn't matter what you did with your body physically because what has been saved and, and, and cleansed and what's going to go forward in the future in heaven is not your physical body, but your spiritual body. And so you can do whatever you want with your physical body, this heresy known as Gnosticism said, but you, you just need to preserve your spiritual, keep close with Jesus. And so really what it was, was it was a license to do whatever you want and sin in any way you want. And that's exactly what the early church in some places infected by this heresy were doing. 
They were partaking in some of the most sinful practices in the surrounding peoples that they lived in. Orgies and all these different things that you would stop and say, what? You're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're taking part in that? And, and, and the Apostle John wanted to encourage people, no, folks, it matters what you do with your physical body. Yeah, you've been saved spiritually, cleansed spiritually, and we're going to be spirit and have a new body in heaven, but it matters here on earth how you live. And so that was a challenge for us to look at how we approach sin, if you remember. Having a cavalier attitude about sin, or really seeing that our sin takes us someplace. Our sin affects us in some very serious ways, and more than just affecting us, or as much as just affecting us. How many of you realized in life, what you do and the sin that you commit oftentimes affects others around you, affects your spouse, affects your children, affects your family and friends, affects where you're going, and even affects how you think God feels about you. And so we don't want to have a cavalier attitude about sin. And John goes over and over and over about the importance of seeing sin the way that God does and knowing what sin does in our lives. But he also reminds them in 1 John chapter 5, verse I think about 13, he reminds them that he writes these things all about living life glorifying God. He writes these things in order that they might know that they have eternal life. Because that was another thing the Gnostics would say, is you can't really know whether or not you're going to heaven or not. You can't really know because, you know, it's all tenuous. And John says, no, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, guess what you can bank on? You can bank on the fact when you breathe your last, you're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the rest that I have prepared for you. We can have confidence in our faith. Because of Jesus Christ, amen? Not because you live a perfect life. None of you here, none of us here live a life perfect. We all fail and make mistakes. And if you confess your sins, 1 John 1, 9 says, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John, I loved those 15 weeks. Those were challenging things for us. And so we went on. After that, and we went to a series called Rooted. And after 1 John, this Rooted series was a four-week series. And the four weeks were talking about planting, growing, pruning, and harvesting. It was really about how to grow deep in your faith. That obviously was the term rooted, grow deep, live strong. How do you grow deep in your faith? And kind of the whole overarching scripture that started that very first week of those four weeks was the parable of the sower, if you remember that. And how it is that all of the seed that God throws out, the truth, the word, life-saving salvation through Jesus Christ, the gospel is sowed, it is sown in the lives of people. And the seed never changes, it's always the truth of the gospel, but what changes, how effective that seed is, is what kind of soil you remember that that seed lands in. And the challenge in that series was what kind of soil is your life? What kind of soil is your heart? And in fact, Jesus in that parable, he talks about four different kinds of soil. The hard soil, which is a hard heart. And that seed's not going to go anywhere. He talks about a troubled heart that's always concerned with the cares of this world. And that seed, it's going to spring up, but the cares are going to choke out. He talked about a fertile or a distracted heart a heart that is easily led astray. And then finally, he talks about the heart that we want to cultivate, a fertile heart, right? A place where we want to grow. And that was how I was encouraged with this the most and how I then tried to share it with you, the congregation, is do you want to grow in your faith because God wants you to grow? God doesn't want to leave you this way, flatline, like, well, I'm a Christian and I'm the same Christian I was this year that I was last year that I was 10 years ago. No, God wants to see us grow in our faith, amen? That's why he plants. That's why he waters. That's why he prunes. We don't like pruning because pruning cuts back, right? Anybody a pruner in here? You guys go around and prune people? Kidding. You go around and prune your garden. You prune your, your roses. You prune your shrubs. We all know what that means. You cut back the dead stuff. You cut back the stuff that's not full of life. 
and God prunes in our life as well. And that week, I remember people that were a little bit like, oh, yeah, I don't really like God to prune me. I don't like him to cut off things in my life that aren't growing, that aren't healthy. I, it's painful at times. But you know what? God is a loving farmer, isn't he? He knows what to prune, and he wants to do it because ultimately he wants to see, see new life come out of the dead. He wants to see new growth come out where you're stunted. He wants to see us grow. And I was challenged by saying, do we want to see our relationship with him grow as well? Do we want to see us grow in ways? Are we willing to do some things? Are we willing to let him prune some areas that need to be pruned that we might continue to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ? How many of you want to grow in 2019? Not just as a person, not just your bank account, but how many of you literally want to grow in your faith spiritually? I, I, I love it. No, not me. I don't want to grow spiritually. No, we all do. I would think. That's why you're here. You might say, well, I, I do, but I don't know how to grow. Go back and listen to the Rooted series, or I'll do it again, right? There are so many ways, and I'm going to talk about something at the end that I believe is really going to help us grow as a church in 2019. But I want to encourage you, be honest. God, I want to grow this next year. I, I, want, to see myself, I want to see myself increase in my faith, increase in the, the fruit like Peter was talking about. These areas, this goodness and this kindness, the perseverance, and all of those things that go into a productive Christian life, I want to grow in some areas. I don't know if you're a goal setter. I don't know if you're a, a person that makes New Year's traditions or New Year's resolutions, but I really want to encourage you on paper or not, be honest with yourself and ask, are you going to grow in 2019 in your relationship with Jesus Christ? And if so, how? It won't happen on its own, will it? You need to do something. And that's what that Rooted series reminds us of. And so then after 1 John and after Rooted, we came to a series that I know a lot of people were uncomfortable with. This series was called Sex in a Broken World. How many of you remember when I said in the front that I'm going to do a series on sex? I remember getting emails and, and, and people coming up and saying, well, how are you going to do that? What, what are we going to talk about? And what's this going to look like? And is this going to be okay if my kids are in here? Is this PG or is this R? Oh, yeah, it's church. It's going to go R, right? No, if you remember, this series, I was blown away by how awesome it confronted the stuff of this world and how much our world is out of control sexually. That's why I called the very first of that four-week series, I called it uh, World Gone Wild, right? Because we are a world gone wild sexually. And God created sex as a godly, holy thing. God created intimacy between a man and a woman for procreation, but also for intimacy and also even for them to enjoy one another. It's a very good and godly thing. And the last thing I ever do is want to hear about and talk about your own sexual situation in your lives. I have people that will ask, hey, we have some problems. Do you do counseling? And I, as a pastor, will always sit down with somebody. I will always listen to somebody. But I usually refer 95% of the issues after a first or second conversation, I usually always try and encourage, depending if they want it, encourage people to get with a counselor. And I've got a great couple of counselors that I suggest. Some of you know and you've been to a one or two of them. And so when it comes to these issues, my prayer is that you heard what God had to say about the purity of sexuality, not just between a husband and wife, but for you that are single. God wants us to live lives that are pure sexually in how we approach people, and how we see people, how we see men, and how we see women, how we see each other, how we interact, and how we treat one another. Yeah, I know. I see people starting to get, okay, let's not go too deep into sex again, okay? We got through it already. But you know what? It's something that the Bible talks about. It's something the churches don't like to talk about, but it's something the Bible talks about, and if you know us, we're a church that teaches through the Bible. We're a church that believes in all of God's word. And so we don't need to shy away from something the Bible confronts because sex is something the Bible talks about often in a godly way. 
So that was a four-week series. And you know what? Right after that, we then went to a series called First Fruits. And this First Fruits series, if you remember, was a series that we did. I think it was about three weeks. I think I lost one of my uh, sermons in my notes. Um, but it was a three-week series, and First Fruits was all about giving God our best. Not just with giving God our money, but giving God our very best with how we live our lives, with giving God our passion. I've always said in life to people, if you can't do what you do with passion, find something else to do, because a life lived passionately, pathos, is so much more rewarding than a life lived without passion. Anybody agree with that? You say, well, what's the measure of passion? Well, yeah, that's for you to decide. You can say, well, I'm passionate, and one person's level of passion may not be the same as another person's level of passion, but the reality is, folks, I want to pursue my relationship with God with passion. How about you? I want to be passionate about how I'm growing in my faith. You can kind of see a theme and a thread throughout everything we even taught. Because it's what the Bible contains. First fruits. That first week we talked about what it meant to give God offerings. And how God desires us to bring him offerings. From the very beginning he established with his people. Bring to me the first fruits, the best of what you have. And I will bless. And I will multiply what you have if you bring to me. But you know what? If you remember, we looked at several different things. About people who brought stuff. About Cain and Abel who brought stuff, they both brought something. About a widow who brought something, even about David who brought something. And the reality is it's not so much what you bring, it's how you bring it. It's the attitude that you have in giving whatever you have, our time, our talent, our treasure. And so that's why it is that we have as our scripture, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, we have as our giving. It says, whatever you decide to give to God, give joyfully. And that's the heart that God wants us to have. If you can give to him your service on Sunday mornings, getting here early and helping us set up, if you can give in the children's ministry, if you can spend some time with the youth ministry, helping Andre and Crystal down with our youth, if you can give sacrificially by writing a check, or if you can give by serving in one of our home groups and hosting a home group, there's a whole lot of places, not to mention all the community outreach stuff that we do. All of it is predicated on a desire really to give God what we have joyfully. Nobody wants to come, oh, okay, I'm here to give, and what, what do we have to do today? Really? Okay, well, I'll do it. I mean, how much fun is that to be around? Now, I, that's not the kind of service, that's not the kind of giving, sacrifice that God's looking for. He's looking for a joyful heart, isn't he? He's looking for a sacrificial heart that gives joyfully. If you can give $10 a month joyfully, then do it. If you can give $1,000 a month joyfully, then do it. But the joyful part is what God is looking for. It's not necessarily what you give, it's how you give it. And that's what First Fruits is all about. I was challenged myself as well to look at my attitude at times, to look at my heart at times as I give and as I have to be a part of things. I was always challenged by that. After First Fruits, then we looked at the judges. That was... Second, the, the last one that we'll talk about, Judges, was about, I think, 15 weeks as well. It was supposed to be a six-week series, but it turned into a 15-week series because there's just so much good stuff in there. Who wants to rush through it, right? I loved looking at all the different judges that we had. I loved seeing how it was that Samson or Gideon or Deborah or Ehud or, or Othniel, Shamgar, if you remember all those things and how it was that God raised up judges, he raised these guys up not to condemn the people, but he raised up the judges in order to guide the people back to him, in order to point the people to him at a time when they struggled in their faith. And they were struggling in the book of Judges. It was probably one of the lowest points in the nation of Israel where they were at spiritually. And so God provided, raised up these saviors raised up these encouragers, these judges. Some of them did well. Some of them didn't do so well. But in the end, God used them all. And probably the biggest thing I was challenged with is how much God can use any single person, faults and all. We get this construct in our mind that if you want to help out in church, if you want to be a, a Bible study leader, if you want to host a home group, if, if you want to be a pastor, 
if you want to be a leader and if you want to do something big in God's kingdom, then you, then you better get everything lined up perfectly, right? You better weed out some areas of your life because if not, God can't use you. I know people feel like that because there are times I have felt like that in the past in my life. I've talked to a whole lot of pastors over the years that feel like, well, why isn't God blessing what we're doing? Maybe it's because um, this is going on, or maybe it's because I struggle with that, and if I just get that struggle figured out, then God will start to bless things. Oh, you mean if you're perfect? Let me know how that one works out for you, because none of us will ever be perfect, will we? God uses us in spite of our imperfections. Doesn't mean it's a license then to say, well, then I'm just going to imperfect it up, right? I'm going to live it up and God will use me nonetheless. No, he's striving for holiness and purity in our lives. He wants to see those things grow because that's how it is, folks, that oftentimes we feel like we have that close relationship. If you're living like hell and trying to come in and have a relationship, then it's really hard. You feel like a hypocrite because in many ways that's what you are. So it's not a license to sin. But folks, you can serve God right now in your life no matter what you got going on. If you don't believe me, read again the story of Samson. If you don't believe me, read again the story of Gideon. Or, or read the story of Deborah. Or read the story of any of these guys and gals that God raised up. And for that matter, look at the disciples. Look at Peter. Does that guy have everything together? <laughs> Not in any way, shape, or form. God can take what we have and who we are. And through the process of desiring to serve him, guess what? God will grow you even more in that process. God will use you even more. Judges was a challenge. There was some dark stuff in that book. And there was some challenging things to look at. Some of the, the warfare and some of the, the, the genocide between different peoples inside of Israel and the tribes and all the different stuff that happened. And there was some dark stuff in there, but yet God was in the midst of it because ultimately he is our main judge, isn't he? Jesus is our ultimate judge. Ah, we're not there yet. He is our ultimate judge. And guess what Jesus doesn't do when he judges? Jesus doesn't condemn us, does he? Jesus took our condemnation on himself. He was condemned for us so that we won't hear guilty. We instead hear not guilty. We instead hear through Jesus Christ and his shed blood, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest that I have prepared for you. Judges was awesome. And then, you know, because it was just up there, we ended with the best Christmas ever. And we looked for four weeks at those gifts that God gives us. Week one, we looked at the gift of hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We looked at the second week, the gift of what? Peace. And then we looked at the gift of joy. And then Christmas Eve, we looked at the gift of love. God's unconditional love, his active love, and his generous love. Amen? And I love going back. And I, I spent all week looking through not just the ser series, but I started to read those different messages I gave again. And God started to remind me of some things that I forgot because none of us remember things perfectly. And you know, as I did all of that, the question I have for myself and the question I have for us as a church, that's a healthy dose of God's word. 1 John, 15 weeks. That was a healthy dose. Judges for 15 weeks. That's a healthy dose. Guess where we're going next in the new year? We're going to do the book of 1 Samuel, which guess what is the continuation of where we left off in the book of Judges, which is what God raises up a prophet named Samuel and then ultimately, Samuel anoints the first king of Israel named Saul, the first king of Israel. And, and, and that's where the monarchy begins. I love it. There's so much we're going to learn as we look at the book of 1 Samuel. But the question you have to ask yourself as we look at Scripture is, does it make a difference in your life? Is the amount of time that you're coming in and you're opening up your Bible and you're reading along with us, you're reading it on the screen, is it making a difference in your life? Has it made and is it making a difference in your marriage? The time that we spend looking at God's word, the challenge that God gives us. Is it making a difference in how you parent your kids? 
Is it making a difference in how you view sexuality? Because the last thing we want to do as people is to come in and hear God's word and have it go in one ear and right out the other. Now, we don't, we don't say that. We're like, oh, I don't know what he said. Who cares? Let's go again. No, we say, oh, well, that was good. Yeah, I was challenged there. All right, what's next series? Yeah, that was good. Oh, the, what's the next series? Yeah, that was good. I like that. But if we aren't able to stop and say, yeah, not only is it good, but I'm also growing in my faith. I'm also applying these things in greater ways in my faith. I'm applying what we learned in 1 John in our view of sin. I'm applying what we learned in Rooted and how it is that we are responsible for the soil of our lives and how much we grow. I, I, I was challenged and encouraged by, by the whole view of sexuality and seeing God's word and the purity that he really instilled or desires our sexuality to have. Even between my husband and wife, that can be worship, right? As we're partaking in that gift from God, that can be worship. Are these things growing or do we hear them? And then we go out and we're the exact same people we were. We're the exact same kind of husband that we are to our wife or we're the exact same wife that we were to our husband. We're the same fearful. We're the same selfish. We're the same domineering. We're the same angry. We're the same addicted. We're the same whatever negative thing you can think of in your life. Are those things beginning to dissipate? And as Peter said at the beginning in, in that, that section of Scripture, Second Peter, are those things starting to grow more that God wants to grow? It reminds me of what James said about God's word having an impact in our lives. He says in James chapter 1, verse 22, he says, do not merely listen to the word. Every Sunday, you folks come in, and unless you're falling asleep and I can't see it, you're listening to the word, right? You're hearing it. And, and James says, do not merely just listen to the word and deceive yourselves, lie to yourselves. But be the kind of person, he says, that does what it says. You're actually taking it seriously and saying, yep, I need to grow in this. Yep, I need to be honest about this area of my life, as that series just pointed out. Don't just merely listen to it and lie to yourself. Instead, he says, do what it says. And then he goes on to say, anyone who listens to the word hears it, but doesn't apply it to their life and do what it says is like a man or a woman, read that, who looks at their face in a mirror and after looking at himself, themselves, they go away and they immediately, what did I look like? Did, did I have something on my nose? Did I have something on my teeth? You know, is my hair all disheveled? They immediately, he says, forget what they look like. In other words, they immediately walk out and forget what they're supposed to do. And I want to encourage us as a church in 2019. And I, I'm not in any way saying that this isn't true. I might challenge is that this would be true. My challenge for myself is that I would be a person that doesn't just preach these things, but actually is growing in these things as well. My challenge for you is you're not just a person who hears these things, but you're growing in these areas of your life as well. And you want to take 2019 and you want to say, God, I want to grow even more. God, I don't want to be the same person at the end of 2019 that I was at the beginning. I want to have more faith in you because of the time we spend in your word. I want to have more trust in you because of the time we spend focusing on your promises and on your word. I want to be a person that, and then fill in the blanks in the ways that you know God wants to grow you. And one of the ways that I believe, folks, that we're going to be able to do that is by doing more of what we already do. And so you've heard me say um, over the last several weeks that one of the encouragements that I want to give to us as a church is that you would join me. I'm going to do this personally in my own devotional time. I've already been doing it. Um, I'm going to do this in 2019. I want to encourage us to go through the Bible this next year. Start to finish. Read it through. Now you might say, well, that sounds hard. I don't think I can do that. That's okay. You know, there's no requirement here. We're not going to take any sort of census and survey, and then if you don't, out you go. That, that's ridiculous. But as a pastor, I want to encourage us to be more into God's word in 2019. And you don't need to raise your hand, but you know what? If you've never read God's word all the way through, there is so much 
that will encourage you and help you grow in your relationship with the Lord. So I've already sent out with this, Ryan, put that up again. I've already sent out this graphic on Facebook. I already put out the challenge on Facebook, and there's a link on our Facebook page to one of the one-year Bible reading programs. Um, and quite frankly, you, all you have to do is Google um, reading the Bible in a year, and you will have plan after plan after plan after plan come up. And so the way I do it is I read the Old Testament and the New Testament every day. About three chapters in the Old, one chapter in the New. And every day, 365, by the end, you'll have read all of the Old Testament, 39 books, and all of the New Testament, 27 books. And you will have under your belt an entirety of seeing all 66 books of God's Word. So that's my encouragement to us. We're going to continue to teach God's Word the way that we do. I'm going to continue to do series, and I'm going to continue to do book studies. But I also want to encourage us in your personal time, your private time. If you've never done it, take the challenge with me and read through the Bible this year and see if that doesn't contribute to more of the growth that God wants to do in your life. How many of us want to grow in our relationship with Jesus in 2019? Raise it up high. It's going to take us making an effort. And it's going to take us being people who not just hear the word, but also do what it says. Amen.